Episode 4 of the StarCast Variety Show is brought to you by the Ace of Wands. Join me, Christiana Gaudet, my co-host Frank Kwiatkowski, and the StarCon community as we work to ignite creativity and inspiration. Hey Frank, how you doing? I am excellent. How are you, Christiana? I am very well and so excited for episode four of the StarCast Variety Show. Can you believe it? Episode four, that is my life path number. So I, I'm a big fan of the number four. It's very solid, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and we have a solid show featuring a really great interview that you got to do. Tell us about it. I was honored to have the opportunity to sit down with Chiro Marchetti. Uh, the tarot maker extraordinaire, fabulous artist. He's done a lot of really great decks. And this was the first of a series of interviews. Uh, I sat down with him for about 15, 20 minutes. I can't wait to share that interview uh, with, our, with our watchers today. Absolutely. And of course, Chiro has been a really important part of StarCon since the beginning. He designed our fairy, who we call Pixie Arcana. She's our, our logo and our symbol. And he has just been a big supporter of StarCon. And at StarCon 2023, he is one of the intensive presenters. He'll be presenting Friday afternoon, January 20th. And people are going to be very, very excited for this. I'm very excited for this. I had the pleasure of moderating Chiro's first presentation. That was the 2020, well, actually technically 21, but it was yep. the, the pandemic one where it was all online. I had the chance to moderate his discussion. It was awesome. And then, of course, the presentation he did last year was fascinating as well. So I have no doubt that he'll be bringing the goods uh, this year as well. Absolutely. So I'll ask you, put you on the spot here. Of all the Chiro Marchetti decks, of which I have, I think I have most of them. I don't have all of them, but I have most of them. Do you have a favorite? I have multiple as well. And I, I still go back most often to the Legacy of the Divine, personally. I love that deck. I loved it from the very first time I used it. It's always read extremely well for me. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you? Do you have a favorite, Christiana? I have to agree with you. Legacy of the Divine is fabulous. I love them all. I, I even have the personalized mystic palette, and I love that one. Mm -hmm. I, I love Gilded. I love Gilded Royale. I mean, there's, I, there's, I've never met a Chiro Marchetti deck that I don't love, mm -hmm. but there is something about Legacy of the Divine, the fact that he made up this whole world, this whole story, and and then told it in the deck and the way the images are, it, it is, it, it probably is my favorite as well. It's the one I go back to the most often. Uh, the one I go back least often is actually his Lenormand, which is not anything against his Lenormand. I just, for whatever reason, can't seem to learn, get myself motivated <laughs> to learn Lenormand. So maybe one year I'll, ha I'll have his deck ready to go when I'm ready to learn Lenormand. Maybe somebody can help me with that. Well, actually, you'll have an opportunity to do that at StarCon 2023 as well. Again, on the intensive day, on Friday in the morning, Brenda Elizabeth, a.k.a. Lady Lenormand, mm -hmm. will be teaching an intensive um, beginner soup to nuts, how to learn and read with the Lenormand deck. So, Good to know. Yeah, your opportunity maybe I'll check that out. <laughs> cool. Good to know. Thanks, Christiana. Sure, sure. So anything else we need to say before we uh, before we get into episode four? I don't think so. I thank all of our audience for joining us again for this episode, and thank you for co-hosting. I say we get to this show. What do you say? Let's do it. Let's do it. First up, Frank speaks with Chiro Marchetti about the fool. I'm delighted to be joined today by an internationally known and highly prolific tarot artist. He's presented at both of the previous two star cons. He will also be presenting at the next one, uh, star con number three here in January of 2023. He's the creator of the Legacy of the Divine Tarot, 
uh, the Tarot of Dreams, the Tarot Decoratif, and many others. Uh, you can learn more about him and purchase his decks, including his indie decks, on his website. That's chiromarchetti.com. And I uh, give a warm welcome to uh, Mr. Chiro Marchetti. Hello, Chiro. Good to have you on the, uh, the StarCast Variety Show today. Good morning, Frank. And how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. A little bit about this segment. Uh, this is the first time we are doing this. This will be uh, the first of multiple, maybe even many segments. And the idea that we have today for our viewers is, uh, is that I'm delighted to have Chiro so we can talk about one specific card that he has made multiple versions of throughout different decks. And uh, today, appropriate for the first time we're doing this, Chiro, we're going to be talking about the fool, uh, the fool. Um, and uh, and so tell me a little bit about uh, looking over multiple versions of the fool. You uh, fascinating. You've done such a wonderful job with this mm -hmm. archetype. Tell mm -hmm. us, if you would, please, a little bit about what kind of message you would like the this character or this archetype to get across. Um, to the users of your deck. So what, what does the fool mean to you and what do you want the fool to mean for, uh, for the people who use your decks, Chiro? Well, I mean, um, it's a autobiography, a visual autobiography in a sense, you know, I, I imagine the fool as being an extension of myself. Um, at the beginning, I, I think I probably misunderstood the initial intent of, uh, of the fall in the sense that it was like the beginning of his life's journey, which indeed it could be. But I thought it more applicable, more appropriate if it was symbolic of the many journeys that we indulge in and we you know, are involved with, not just our lives per se, but all the intricate little variations of that along the way, you know, our journey to a new job, to a new relationship, through uh, dealing with a problem or just various aspects of our life. And it's a continual cycle. It isn't just this one major theatrical play, as it were. And so it's a repeat. Uh, the fool's journey, for me, is best described as the fool's journeys. Um, we often make the same journey. Uh, do we learn from the ones we've done before and the mistakes or the successes of the previous ones? How will they vary? How will the next similar journey vary? The circumstances will vary, as will the adjacent cards in a spread. So that metaphor made more sense to me. Um, I had issues to be honest, uh, with both the Rider Waite Smith and the Marseille's depiction, I felt they were both historically misleading, possibly. You know, the, the, as an analogy, yes, the innocent fool leaping off the cliff with the faithful dog, okay. But equally, that, that was a little bit too, for me, a little bit too symbolic of the first major life's journey it didn't truly communicate that this was possibly one of his or hers many journeys you know and so that didn't quite work for me it was a little bit too dare i say a little bit too twee and didn't possibly communicate the gravitas of the many journeys we take equally the marseilles was a little bit too bite you in the ass as it were <laughs> you know literally literally um the, the fool the traveling jester of those ages may well have encountered uh an unwelcoming scenario or just the, the village dogs being protected whatever but it suggested that he may not have always been welcome which kind of made sense you know in those days all these villages would have been very isolated and, and suspicious of strangers, you know? But I don't think that actually would have been the case with the jester. I think this colorfully dressed character would have been, would have not have been feared. He would have been, a, if anything, 
welcomed, you know, like a, a diversion from an otherwise very boring life existence. And so I think that is also misleading because the fool has two characters. I hope my barking dog isn't going to interrupt too much. Um, the Perfectly appropriate considering the, the card we're talking about, Jerry. There you go. <laughs> so the fool is, is more of a, in historical terms, there was two distinct fools. There was a, a natural fool that was someone who had a, a physical or a mental uh, disability or limitation, which would have been a subject of humor and, you know, and, and just people laughing at him. And if part of his means of earning his living, unfortunately, would have been out of the sort of sympathy factor, his payment in exchange for being allowing people to ridicule him would have been that. The licensed fool would have been someone quite talented. He is the quintessential court jester, and he was talented. He could sing, play an instrument, juggle, dance, and, you know, as in Macbeth or whatever, he was the one that history teaches us had the ear of the king. You know, he acted the fool, but he certainly wasn't. And he had the ability, the privilege, as it were, to be able to interact with the king in a way that other members of the royal court could not. That was a double-edged sword as well. He could tell, and in fact, part of his role was to be the informant of the king of bad news that the other royal members would be too scared to give him. You know, he got away with it, provided he didn't make it too funny, by putting a little bit of a twist, a little bit of a humorous tone on it. And excuse me, your Royal Highness, but your armies are having the ass kicked out of them. Oops, you know, but if he said so he, from him, it was a bit more palatable than from some, than, uh, some military commander having to inform the king of that same thing. So the metaphor of the king uh, of the fool is it's a more complex one than just, you know, oops, I'm off on my life journey. And that's what I've tried to communicate um, in my various images. And I, and I think now is appropriate for me to share the images so I can embellish on those thoughts. Yeah, I, one of the things I noticed, Chiro, and, and thank you for that, because I noticed that you returned to the court jester outfit in multiple versions of your, of your fools. Uh, they're wearing yep. that traditional motley outfit with the bells and all and all of that. That that yep. is an image that you return to that that characterization. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you can you see this, Frank? Can you see the graphics? Um, actually, not at the moment. Um, oh. I I can share it. Um, if you want. Um, let me share. Oh, I beg your pardon. One more button to press. Ah, there we go. Okay, so here's a, a variety of fools from, um, from my various decks. And I'll sc scroll through them. Now, at the beginning, I'll be honest with you, um, I kept it reasonably safe. But in all the first, in the first two, uh, the message I was trying to put across was one of imbalance. You know, the, the fool on his on his merry way, despite of all of our plans for our journey, all of our best intentions and preparations, life can throw us a curve for you. Yeah? And so in both the, the original uh, Gilded and the follow-up Tara Dreams, I try to suggest that, that despite the, the fool's uh, position and sort of dancing or, or, or standing straight here, his entire balance is at the whim of these little elements that can sort of trip him up, or merely the innocent little cat in this case, uh, you know, grabbing for the butterfly could topple this sort of stance, you know. Our, our journeys can only be planned up to a point, yeah? Uh, but they are at the whim of whatever our journeys throw us. 
a break from the dog on that one. You went with yeah. the cat instead, Jiro. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, in this case, uh, I wasn't trying to sort of like be too clever. It's just I felt that the playful cat was more um, compelling a symbol of, of how something so cute and innocent could be the, the reason why this guy was toppled off of his little balancing act, you know, and his journey could be thrown for a loop. Um, then I started, you know, with the legacy, I started to try and communicate that, yes, his journey or journeys would certainly be influenced by and include the various uh, characters and scenes that he would uh, encounter along his journey, journeys of Major Arcana. And there he was, you know, rather than having it in the traditional uh, sort of leather bag or whatever that he would have carried on his thing, I was being a little bit more adventurous here and sort of had more of a play with the carnival-like gesture in a sense, you know, so they, all these future encounters that were being released were coming out of now a sort of a magical box, a carnival box, as opposed to just um, his normal traveling bag, as it were. Um, in the case of the Grand Lux, I was, I don't know if I should say this or not, actually, but- uh, I'll go it, ahead and say it, Jiro. Okay, it'll probably lose me half my sales. Um, but <laughs> um, this was a, my first little, venture into a political statement and in fact the the uh, the gesture in this case was based on on the prime minister of britain at the time which was david cameron who was the the fool in my opinion for having taken the political risk of suggesting there should be a referendum for brexit he did so thinking that it was going to be a slam dunk that it would be rejected and of course, as we all know, the, the referendum proved otherwise and, and Brexit, Brexit took place, which in my personal opinion was a grave mistake. So it was a little tongue in cheek poke at this rather foolish man and his foolish decision and the conse consequences of such choices. Um, in the decoratif, it was back to playing relatively safe with tradition. I mean, the whole purpose of that project was to be faithful to the, the Marseilles. So once again, uh, it, albeit in my decorative style, uh, the dog is tearing away at the guy's clothing. So it's not the friendly little faithful companion from Pamela Coleman's deck but rather, uh, you know, a more decorative version of the, the Marseille's uh, depiction. Um, in the later one, in, in the, the last latest three, um, to be honest, Frank, I, I'm assuming that the majority of people who buy my decks are not beginners. You know, I think most people would be relatively familiar with, with the icon of, icon iconic depiction of the fall. And so it's nothing that has to be relearned as it were. Nevertheless, I have started to get away from the traveling, foolish, innocent person. And I wanted to depict it as a more been there, done that character. You know, I've been on these journeys throughout my life and I've learned from them. And it's kind of a more of a retrospective look at the past as we possibly go further on for yet another little journey of some kind. And this is kind of like serious summary of like, what's it all meant, you know? Did I do well? Did it work for me? What did I learn from it? You know, it's a very introspective, sort of analysis of ourselves and our various journeys and everyone is going to have different answers, you know, but that was it, you know, so he's kind of, and that's meant to be summed up by the guy looking back at his past. And in this sense, the past is 
older Marseille's cards, yeah? In the last one, which is not produced yet, is for a future project, but is on its way, let's say. Once again, back to the, uh, the analogy of the fool, the licensed fool, uh, as opposed to the natural fool, who is naturally foolish through, you know, mental or physical, you know, abilities. The licensed fool is putting on an act. He acts foolishly. The mask he's holding is a smiling one and the one that he uses a lot, but behind that mask, there's an, a common metaphor, isn't it? Uh, we are hiding the truth behind that mask. And the truth is that he's not foolish at all. He's probably a very smart cookie. And he chooses through whatever reason to depict himself and to act the way he does deliberately. Wow, that, that's really fascinating. I. I hadn't quite thought of the fool in that way before. This idea that uh, this licensed fool gives us permission when we draw this card to play the fool um, in a way that can benefit us. It doesn't mean innocence per se. It can mean that we can utilize um, utilize that archetype to to get what we want, as as shown with the mask. In this one example, you have him with the mask, it, the, his foolishness is, is almost a facade then. Yes, I think it is. I mean, I think there's, there's, we all do that to an extent. That's a theme I've commonly repeated in other decks, you know, that we do wear a mask you know, in, a, in, a, in a symbolic way. I mean, the way I am when it's just me on my own thinking by myself is not the same way I act with my immediate family is not the way I would act with my friends or the way I would act in my workplace or the way I would act at a public occasion of some kind surrounded by people I don't know. We all have different degrees of how to act based on the circumstances. That, isn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are putting on a falsehood per se, in a deliberate way to fool, excuse the pun, or um, to present ourselves as being something we're not. Sometimes it's just a natural way to act and a, a way that we socially conduct ourselves. On other occasion, it is an act, very much so. Uh, take the example of, 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 of a professional comedian like Robin Williams, the funniest guy you can imagine, but clearly, Deep down, he was a very, very sad and, and you know, desperate character. I mean, that is a, a very profound analogy of what I'm trying to say, you know, uh, an, an extreme one, certainly, but not an isolated one. So, you know, the, the, for me, the fool is a far, far more complex character than it is in, initially depicted in previous decks. And maybe... It's not necessary to go into this kind of depth. Maybe people are going through, uh, readers are going through that process automatically. But either way, I've, I hope that I have raised some deeper questions and, and analysis of this character through my depictions rather than just, you know, Mr. Happy, let's jump off a cliff, you know. It's, the weather's nice, you know. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing all your insights on The Fool. I, I get a sense we could talk about this much, much longer. I would like to just ask one final question as we as we get ready to wrap up here, Chiro, and thanks yeah. for your time. But uh, there seems to be something unique about The Fool, and maybe this is uh, intrinsic to the fact that it's card number zero, but this yeah. seems to be the one card where you could depict past versions of the same card, like the Marseille version of it, or in the Legacy of the Divine version, how you have these different cards on the Fool card. I don't get a sense you could do that with other cards, but the Fool is the one card where it can be almost like on this meta level where you call back to itself in a way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, from, a, from a marketing point of view, let's say, or an advertising point of view, or a graphic design point of view, um, if, if one 
has to choose an image that is representative of something greater, then uh, the fool serves that role as the symbol of a tarot deck more than any other deck, you know? Uh, uh, excuse me, more than any other card, with the exception maybe of the devil and death, but only because ho Hollywood's messed that up. You know, he's the, the, the preferred villain. But, in, but beyond that, those two cliché cards, the, the, the rest of the deck, nothing sim would symbolise a tarot deck and the whole concept of that more than the fool, I, I think, you know? You wouldn't, if, if I merely showed a hierophant or, or a chariot, uh, for, the, for the majority of people, that wouldn't in of itself suggest a tarot deck as much as the fool would. So I think that would it answer your question to a degree, yeah? Absolutely, yes. Well, again, uh, thank you for your time, Chiro. This is all the time we have for this segment. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, please join us again next time when we sit down and ask Chiro about another card. See you next time. Adios. Now it's time for a panel discussion. What tarot book was most influential for you? Hi, Frank Leakowski here, once again, bringing you a tarot topics discussion panel where we bring together a diverse group of tarot professionals and aficionados to get their perspectives on a given tarot related topic or question. So why don't we get started today by introducing our panel. We've had them on here before and here they are again. We have Beverly Frable, we have Amber Highland and we have Michelle Wells. Welcome everybody. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> All right, let me give a formal introduction. Our in addition to her role as publisher of the Cardomancer magazine, our first panelist is a holistic empowerment coach, dream work specialist, educator, and writer. Visit her website, amberhighland.com, and follow her on Twitter at highland underscore amber, and on Instagram at ancient underscore voices. Please welcome Amber Highland. Hi, Amber. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, and our, our second panelist is the owner of three Soultopia metaphysical stores in Dallas, Texas. She's also the co-host of the Soul What podcast and the Michelle Soultopia YouTube show. She's also the author of two books, including most recently, Spirits Unveiled, A Fresh Perspective on Angels, Guides, Ghosts, and More from Llewellyn Books. And she, she offers intuitive healing sessions, teaches classes on intuitive methods, and also happens to be an attorney Visit her websites, michellewelsh.com and soultopia.guru. Please help me welcome our returning champion, Michelle Welsh. Hi, Michelle. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, and finally, our third panelist uh, offers classes and presentations that dive deep into divination-related topics and that enhance a reader's perspectives. She also dedicates time to individual consultations, demonstrating how to combine a variety of tools to expand on readings. Visit her Facebook page, Tarot Connections, and on Instagram at Beverly underscore Tarot underscore Connections. Please help me welcome Beverly Frable. Welcome back, Beverly. Hey, thank you. All right. So we know what we are doing here with our Tarot Topics panel discussion. We have a list of all kinds of questions that we've put into this little hopper. I pull one out randomly, and we talk about it. It's pretty much that simple. So let's see which one I've got this time. All right, this should make for a good conversation. Please tell us about a tarot book that was instrumental to you when you were first starting to read tarot cards. A, an early book, or maybe two, uh, that was particularly important for you early on. And I don't know about you, but when I think back, some of those images, some of those things that I learned are like, burned into my mind. You know, they, they make such an early impression on you. So if you wouldn't mind, please tell us about a, uh, an early book that had a big, a big early impression on you. Uh, let's see, where should we go first? Uh, I think Beverly wanted to go first today. <laughs> Damn, um, that's a hard question, Frank. I, you know, I, I have to say, you know, I really tried to come up with something in my mind other than 
what most people would say, but I can't. Um, I have to. I have to go with Mary Kay Greer uh, Tarot for Yourself. You know, I've forgotten the exact title, but everyone knows this book. Um, it was that book because that took me through uh, the use of numerol using numerology in connection with tarot to look inside and in, in, in an introspective way um, and really get in touch with myself in a way that I never even considered doing it that way. Um, and that left an impression and, and taught me how deep tarot can really go. I have to say it's that book and you know, a, a lot of people do and I hate following the crowd, but there it is, that's what it is. It, it, well, you went first, so you didn't follow the crowd. Now, well, we'll I mean, everyone else in the thing. world, really. <laughs> it's such a it's such a hugely influential book, and I think it's yeah. interesting too that it's a workbook, which yeah. sets it apart. I know some other people have come out with workbooks, but that seemed to be the original that was uh, kind of structured that way. Uh, and obviously, it's just loaded with so much valuable information. Yeah, great call. Thanks, Beverly. How about uh, how about you, Amber? Um, do you mind sharing what's a, what's an early book that had a big influence on you? Um, it, Angelus Arian um, and the Tarot, Tarot Workbook by Angelus Arian. Um, and it's Toth based, and I, I love the Toth system. And that you know uh, definitely uh, was one. And um, beyond that, then I think another book actually was the original um, Tarot Spells book. Uh, because at the time I was working a lot, my intro with tarot was, wasn't for reading and divination. It was for connecting, Michelle, you'll appreciate this. It was for connecting with spirits and calling specific, the energies of specific saints that I wanted to work with um, and using tarot that way. So that was my first delving into the world of tarot. And then the divination and intuitive readings and all kind of came after that. Um, so it was the tarot spells book and then combined with uh, the Tower Workbook by Angelus Arian. Ah, very good. I have to say, Amber, just to cut in real quick, that that book by Angelus Arian was one of my first ones too. Huge, it had a huge influence on me, and I I remember trying to trying to use it for learning the Rider Waite Smith system as well, and that didn't always really work. So I realized that you had to do it uh, with the with the Toth deck. It worked better for that, but. What a what a great book. Good call. Uh, I can't wait to hear what Michelle says. Michelle, mm -hmm. what what was what was an early one for you that that left such a big impression on you? None, actually, because I wasn't allowed to read them. And so I grew up in a home where I wasn't allowed to uh, look at the decks. So I had a deck that my aunt gave me and I would secretly use that deck and I had no books at all. So um but, you know, of course, uh, I know of all the great books and in, the, in our stores, we carry so many great books that, I mean, I just can't even tell you how many there are. And, and really, it, it, different books appeal to different people. You know, I will, since we've already mentioned Mary Kay Greer, I'll, I'll mention Rachel Pollack. I mean, her, her book, The 78 Degrees of Wisdom, I believe that one is, am I right in saying that? Um, so, but for me, honestly, I had to learn and I, I learned and I taught myself and I had other people and my aunt teach me, but I also had no books at all. Um, I had the Bible. And um, so just to be honest with you guys, that's that's where I came from. And so it's it's a, a big shift for me, which is a whole nother. I don't want to take too much time, but that is the honest answer. So now I read every single book that comes in our store. So I read three to five books a week. Uh, and I literally, it does not come in my store unless I have read it. And the books are um, wonderful, most of them. And some, some are not so great, but most, I, I can run, recommend so many of the new ones too. I really actually love Ben Bell Wynn's Holistic Tarot. That's a very good book, but yeah. I, hate to, I hate to leave anyone out. They're yeah. also good. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, there are so many, so many great books, but the one, the classic, a lot of the huge classics have already been brought up. The Mary Kay Greer book, the Rachel Paulo book, Vanabelle Wenz is a bit newer than those, but it is it, it goes into the pantheon, right? Of like books that are going to be used for many years uh, from now. It's It'll be in print for may many, I, many years. May I mention one more that just sells like crazy in our store? Um, Teresa Reed's book, and I can't remember the name of it, Tarot for whatever. Um, her, read, her, her book sells like nobody's business. We can sell that all day long, every day. So oh. I would I would also recommend that book. Sorry to oh. interrupt. 
Yeah. No, that's that's okay. Thank you for that, Michelle. I I can't help but think though, like this discussion could go off in a different direction. As I think about the fact that you said that you you learn tarot without any books whatsoever, uh, strictly through reading the cards. Uh, you had a Bible, but you were you were um, taught by an aunt, you say, or a grandmother. An aunt. An aunt. So you yeah. how long how long how long were you reading tarot before you read any tarot books whatsoever? 20 years. Wow. That's that's quite incredible. I, mean, I, was, I was little when she gave me my tarot cards. So little, maybe it was 15 years. Okay. Wow. Um, I'm trying to imagine how that would go. That that is a, a uniquely different way to learn the cards. Uh, I won't say better. I won't say worse. It's just, it's very much different than the way a lot of people learn. I mean, you get a book, right? You get a deck, of course, but you get a book and you read the book, but not for you. I wouldn't recommend it. No, <laughs> <laughs> I would not recommend my way. I would recommend what Beverly and Amber uh, and you, and you have to say about it, but that it was just an honest answer. Fascinating. All right. So maybe we can shift this conversation just a little bit because I know we don't have a ton of time, but maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, a book that has been influential for you maybe a little bit more recently. Uh, Michelle, you've already shared some thoughts on that, but uh, I wanted to switch things maybe over to uh, uh, Beverly or Amber or something uh, that you've read or that has impressed you a little bit more recently. I know you both uh, read a lot of tarot books and it's hard to pick just one. So d we're not insulting anybody by leaving them out, but just pick one uh, just off the top of your head that, that you've, you've liked more recently from when you started. I go first or you want to go Amber? Yeah, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. Cause I've got a couple of my, my mind. So I'm yeah. going to pick I, one I, in I saw you calculating there. I'll, I'll just, yeah, well, mine, yeah, yeah. Mine, mine isn't a tarot book, quite honestly. It, it's a book about runes. Um, and I'm really uh, kind of more into divination on a broader scale than just tarot, you know, and I'm really into like the older methods of, of reading and runes is definitely in that category. Um, and that's kind of one of the newer areas I've been studying. But since I've been studying it, I came across and there's a lot of people that wrote, it's, you know, several good books. There's some good and bad ones out there. But the woman that I came across that I, I just was floored by um, is Ingrid Kincaid is her name. Um, and she's called the Rune Lady uh, or something like that. Her website is there. Her, her, she's on the internet. Uh, I mean, she has a web page, but she's written two books. Um, and the two books really are not so much about runes, although they are. Uh, they're more about like uh, divination in, in, in general. Um, and it's really uh, how to tie it in the darker side, the shadow side of life, and also nature and how to make them all work together to get, you know, the messages that are meant to come through. Um, and I have to say, it really opened my eyes and it wasn't just about runes. Um, so that book really was more recently the one that hit me, like big time aha moments um, came to me from those books. So that's what I would have to say. Mm. Fabulous. Thank you, Beverly. And yeah. of course, yeah, the, this discussion doesn't have to be limited just to tarot, of course. It's tarot topics, but StarCon is about all methods of divination and they all sort of bleed into each other and they all feed each other through correspondences and all Absolutely. that. So so thank you very much for bringing that uh, to our attention. I hadn't hadn't heard about that. I haven't delved into the uh, runes. It's been kind of it's been in the background, just kind of inviting me at some point, I'm going to yeah, get into it. It can be intimidating because you have these symbols that, you know, there's a little bit of memorization, but a little bit of not, I mean, but honestly, it's well worth the investment of time, in my opinion. Right. Um, and it really does tie a lot of other things together for a person. It's not really just about runes. You, you, other doors open and I'll stop there. <laughs> All right. I know I get a sense you could say much, much more about I could, it. I could, but you know, I'm an only child, so I know to shut up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> virtual well i wanted to uh, amber you've had a couple minutes to kind of think of something i hope i'm not putting you on the spot but um what do you think no uh, no not at all and i'm actually going to go with um tarot inspired life by jamie elford mm. and because it gives really practical ways to bring the use of tarot into your everyday um and in ways that you might not think of right off the bat how easily it is to work in 
a project. If people want to be doing um, a mindful meditation or um, not magic, for those of us that, that work with not magic, she talks about crocheting your own tarot bag. Well, what a way to bring in different modalities of what you like and your belief systems and your energies by putting this energy into making a, a tarot bag for your deck as you're learning your deck and bonding with whatever deck that is. So I'm going, I'm going with tarot inspired life. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, I think that's uh, about all the time we have for today. Uh, we got plenty of book recommendations, including from Michelle, the idea that you can learn tarot without any kind of books, although she would not recommend it. Is that about right, Michelle? That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank our panel very much for being with us again uh, this time, including Beverly Frabel, Michelle Welch, Amber Highland. Thank you all very much. And we will see you next time for our uh, tarot topics discussion panel. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's learn a tarot spread. Hi, it's me, Christiana Gaudet, and I want to share with you one of my favorite tarot spreads. This is a spread I use very often for myself, sometimes with clients, and I love to teach it to my students. It's a seven card spread, and it's what I call a comprehensive spread. That means you don't really need a question. It can just address many departments of life and let you know what's going on. If you have a question, you can certainly interpret this spread in the context of that question. Now, to demonstrate it, I am using my Universal Celtic Tarot. It's tiny, this is my purse deck. I'm not even going to be showing you the fronts of the cards. I just want you to see the shape of the spread and how the cards interact with each other. If you're listening rather than watching, don't worry. I will be very clear in how I describe it. But first, I got to tell you the story of how this spread came to me. So imagine going back a few decades when I am a brand new baby tarot reader. I had been reading casually, studying, reading for friends and the friends of friends and friends and, you know, strangers here and there, but not professionally for about eight years. And so on this one Saturday morning, I arrived to work at my first psychic fair. And I arrived a few minutes early, of course, because I wanted to get set up and the other readers were so gracious. And one sort of called me over to his table and said, okay, so you're new, what questions do you have? And my biggest concern was readings were 15 minutes. A bell would go off at the end of 15 minutes and I'd be done. I had never had to work with a timer. I like longer readings. I tend to do readings that are an hour or, or even longer sometimes. And so 15 minutes was scary. And so this reader taught me this spread. Now, true confessions, I didn't actually use this spread. I managed to stay within the 15 minute confines in a different way, but I never forgot this spread because it is such a good spread. It's called the Seven Sisters or the Horseshoe Spread. And the cards are indeed arranged in a horseshoe shape. It's seven cards. So we have three cards on each side going up and then the middle card at the very top of the spread. Now, traditionally, this spread is read from right to left, which I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Modern readers tend to like to go left to right. I was always taught right to left, uh, so that might just be a generational thing. Do what feels right to you. So I'm gonna go through the positions so the first card down at the bottom on the right, past, next card, present, next card, future. So past, present, future, that three card spread that we are all so familiar with, that is the first three cards of this spread. Now the fourth card, which is at the very top, that's your significator. And it's a significator chosen as ran at random. 
It is the fourth card that is pulled. So it is interpreted as who you are at this current time. So if you're reading for yourself, it's who you are at this current time. If you're reading for someone else, for a querent, it's who they are at this current time. The next card, which now begins the descent to the other side of this arc or this horseshoe or this rainbow, is a person or energy that is close to the querent. So if you're reading for yourself, it's a person or energy close to you. If you're reading for someone else, it's a person or energy close to them. The next card, which is the second to last card, is a problem or obstacle. And the final card, all the way down in the lower left, ending this horseshoe or this arc or this rainbow is final outcome. Now, when you read this spread, you want to pay attention to a few things because even though there's only seven cards in this spread, there are some positions that are very similar in their meaning. So if you look at the cards that are in positions of similar meanings and put them together, that's going to help you a lot in your interpret interpretation because if they're similar, they'll strengthen each other. If they are radically different or opposites, that will give you some sense of either, well, there's this, but there's that. There's a conflict here. You have to pay attention to both of these things. You can blend the cards together to get a deeper meaning. So that second card, which is present, in a way is very similar to the fourth card, Significator, who you are at this current time. So you're gonna to wanna to look at those two cards together. The future card, the third card in, is very similar, of course, in meaning to the final outcome, the last card. So you wanna look at those two cards together. If they're similar, you have a clear prediction on the future. If they're very different, then maybe there's choices to make on your way to, to get where you're going. You can use this spread in a lot of different settings for a lot of different kinds of questions or indeed just as a general reading going in without a question. So again, in the shape of a horseshoe, starting from the left, going to the right, past, present, future, who you are at this current time, person or energy close to you, problem or obstacle, final outcome. Use it for yourself, use it for others, have fun. Thanks so much. If you want to drop a comment and let me know how this spread worked out for you, I'd love to know. So we did it. That's a wrap on episode four. Episode four, Christiana. A lot of good stuff here. I want to thank again, Chiro Marchetti for sitting down and having that interview on The Fool. Always love getting his insights. And of course, our panel as well. Beverly, Amber, and Michelle were all awesome. Uh, very much enjoyed spending that time with them. And Beverly, Amber, Michelle, and Shiro will all be presenting at StarCon 2023. So you got to get your tickets now. You can join us in person or online. You can join us for one day, two days, or the whole weekend. Just go to StarCon.com. That's S-T-A-A-R-C-O-N.com. Get your tickets. Get them now. And if you're coming in person, you really want to make that hotel reservation. We will sell out of hotel rooms. I have mine. I got it last month, and I will certainly be there all weekend. I can't wait to see you there, and I can't wait to see all of the StarCon attendees there as well. So, yeah. Uh, everybody make sure to get your tech tickets because I look forward to seeing you. Absolutely. And I want everyone to know that your interview with Chiro Marchetti, which we was the highlight of this episode, actually continues and will continue into a few more episodes. So if you can't get enough Chiro, you're going to get some more in episode five. Thanks again, Chiro. And thank you again, Christiana. I will see you next episode. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye. This has been the StarCast Variety Show with Frank Kwiatkowski and me, Christiana Gaudet. 
special thanks to Chiro Marchetti, Michelle Welch, Amber Highland, and Beverly Frabel. StarCon 2023 is coming soon. Learn more and get your tickets at StarCon.com. That's S-T-A-A-R-C-O-N dot com.